jump right in. I want to jump right in. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Mike Scan. I'm the senior pastor here, and we are in week three of a series on prayer and fasting. And we got a lot of ground to cover today. So I typically will kind of go into a intro, you know, kind of an introduction of you know where we've been, where we're going. But we need to move because I have a lot of stuff here, and I think the uh, anyhow, let's just jump in right here because one of the thoughts that I want I want to leave with you today, and this is really if I could like paint the picture of where we're going and what what I want you to leave with today. No matter what what I say today, I want, I want I want us to remind. I want to kind of step back and do some reminding, some things that many of you know, but I think it's good to be just you know be reminded of truth. Um, if we are called to be disciples if that's what we are called to be, of Messiah, meaning that we are to imitate him because a disciple is an imitator. That's our. That's what it is. It means that we imitate Messiah. Um, then interceding for others in prayer better be at the top of the list. So you want to guess what we're going to talk about this morning? Well, prayer, yes. But we're going to talk about intercession. And here's the thing. I want to go back because I think there's a passage of scripture that we use a lot within the community. We we use it a lot. And when I say community, I'm meaning in the Torah community, the way, whatever we want to call what Yahweh has brought all of us into. There's a scripture that a lot of us use in apologetics that we use typically to defend why we do what we do. And it's found in 1 John. I'm going to go through there in a minute. But as Messiah's disciples, we are called if we're if we believe that we're called to imitate him, then I want I want to point some things out real quick. First John two and five. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of Yahweh, the love of God, is truly made perfect. We know that we are in him by this. Whoever claims to abide in this word abide, we're gonna we're gonna unpack that here in just a minute. Must what? Walk just as he walked. Now, I don't believe anybody in this room or even online who are joining us today would ever debate this. We typically use this as our scripture, our go-to passage when we're talking about bringing and obeying Torah. But I'm going to submit to you today that I think it goes much, much deeper than that. And I think we're missing it. I think, yes, absolutely, we live a Torah life. Why? Because this is one of the ways we display our love for Yahweh, is walking out obedience. And that's what Messiah did. So no claim, no argument there. But I think there's a path, I think there's something missing when we really take a look at this passage. This word uh, to walk is the word in the Greek, it's peripateo. And it refers to the act of walking, obviously, like we're moving from point A to point B. However, figuratively, it refers to action. And how we are to behave, live, or conduct our lives. That's why we believe when we read that passage, it is really a great indication that we should be following the Torah, the commandments of Yahweh. No argument there. However, I think it goes beyond that. Like, go beyond the Torah? How can you say that? Because if we're going to imitate Jesus, if he's our example, then he has to be our example in everything. In every area of our life. So we can look at Messiah. We can honestly take a moment and just step back, look in the mirror. The reflection that we look at should be that of Messiah. We should see Messiah in the things that we live, in the way we talk, in the way we behave, in every area that we live. Andrew Murray said this. I love what Andrew Murray said. Watch this. Andrew Murray said, now, if you don't know who Andrew Murray is, like if you really want to talk about a pastor who did a lot of talking about fasting and prayer, Andrew Murray is your guy to go to. He wrote some extraordinary, rich, deep meanings of the word when he talked about prayer. And he says, the attempt to pray consistently for ourselves, watch this, must be a failure. What? It is what? It is an intercession for others. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about imitating Messiah. He says, it's in the intercession of others that our faith and love and perseverance will be aroused. Wait a minute. You mean not praying for myself? You mean it's not about me? Who would have thought such a thing? And that the power, watch this, the power of the Ruach, the power of the Spirit be found which can fit us for saving men. In other words, listen, if we don't have intercession in our life, we are lacking. 
We are lacking. This is powerful. Today, we are going to look at Jesus. But I want you to, I want to look at Messiah from a different perspective this morning. In Romans 8, I've got a lot of scriptures. I'm going to move kind of quick. In Romans 8, it says then, what then shall we say in view of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, we've quoted that, haven't we? Come on, somebody, right? Like, like anytime we're attacked, like, hey, if God's for us, who can be against us, right? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not also with him, you ready? Freely give us all things. I want you to hold on to that. It's going to mean something here in a little bit. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. In other words, if Yahweh, our God, our creator, sacrifices himself, sacrifices Messiah the Son, right? What, and he's willing to do that. What else would he be able to do? To well, according to Scripture, he'll freely give us all things. Does this matter? Absolutely it matters. Absolutely it matters. One thing, if nothing else, now this isn't a blame it, you know, blab it, grab it, name it, claim it type message. So just relax for a second, right? But here's what it is, is that this, when we read this, we should, there should be faith. Faith should well up inside us. Knowing that whatever we go for before Yahweh and petition him, the Bible says that we already have. Now, obviously, you know, this is within the context of obedience. This is not just like whimsical, throw scripture out, whatever you think you want. We talked about that last week. It's powerful. Well, the Hebrew word here that we're talking about, this word intercession, is powerful because it's the word in Hebrew, it's pagah. It has multiple meanings. Multiple meanings. It can mean to meet or encounter. It could, uh, it means to entreat. It means, obviously, to make intercession, to stand in the gap, to come between. This is what I want you to grab a hold of, to come between. This is good. Look at Romans 8, 34, right? Who is the one who condemns? It is Messiah. Who died and moreover was raised and now is at the right hand of Yahweh and what? also intercedes for us. So we're going to say that we are following Yeshua as our Messiah, our King. We're disciples of him. Then imitation is going to be so critical tonight or today. If we truly want to imitate Messiah, look at this. This is absolutely a game changer. What did he do? He came between. What did he come between? Between the wrath of a holy Yahweh, holy God, Elohim, and an unholy people. What does he do? He stands in the way. And what does he do? He gives himself up. Perfect. Holy. And he does what? He comes between. Another Hebrew word that can also be translated in, the, in this word intercede is palel, which means to pray or bring supplication. Have you ever supplicated for someone? Have you ever closed yourself in a room and didn't move. Intercession is the act of praying to Yahweh on behalf of others. It can be sacrifice of time and focus and a way to lay down one's life for another. It's exactly what Messiah did. So I understand we need to imitate Messiah in the things of the Torah. I absolutely agree with that. But I want to challenge you and ask the question individually. Like, are you imitating him in prayer? Are you imitating him when it comes to interceding, to standing in the gap, to praying for the weak and the helpless, those who are lost, those who are broken, those who are in bondage, those who are under strongholds? It's going to get deep tonight. It's going to hurt. It's interesting, as I was studying this, I looked up a definition for prayer. And this is what ask.com or askingalot.com says. It says that prayer, prayer is to our lives, watch this, what fuel is to an engine. 
we will not go very far in life without a healthy prayer life. I absolutely 100% believe this. Like, how can you grow if you don't know what Yahweh's telling you to grow in? If you have issues in your life, how do you know unless you go to the author and let him get into our business, get into our heart? We will not go very far in life without a healthy prayer life. Watch this. Intercession is a step up from prayer. Intercession is praying. Oh, this is so good, guys. Intercession is praying God's heart into a specific situation or standing in the gap. Thank you. Intercession is praying for God's heart into a specific situation or standing in the gap on behalf of a person or region in need of mercy and grace. So let me present something to you. We've been hitting this pretty hard lately, right? Let's t- let's pause for a moment and look at our culture. Let's look at your community. Now, we have people here from all over the place. We have people here from down by San Antonio today. We have people from the Greenville area. We got people all the way from Mount Vernon, like traveling <laughs> every week. Praise God. So faithful. We have people from all over North Dallas. We have people that used to be from Oklahoma. Got right with you, Yahweh. And have now moved to Texas. Amen. But let's look at this from a serious perspective, right? Is our is our world, let me go back. Let me look at this. Let's just look at this for a second, right? Standing or standing in the gap on behalf of a person, a region in need of mercy and grace. Does our world need mercy right now? You better believe it. Things are fixing to get shaken. Things are shaking up right now as we speak. Things are getting really bad out there, people. And I'm not up here to tell you the, you know, I'm, I'm you know, when I, nobody know, but you can look outside, turn on the news. Hopefully, you're not watching most of that poison, anyways. We have a lot of things happening in our country, in our world. That people need prayer. We need to be in intercession. Yeshua's role as intercessor was prophesied. It's prophesied in Isaiah 53. He did this on the tree and the sacrifice by coming between us and a holy God, bridging the gap that sin had created. Isaiah 53, verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall be divided the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I am like, I was talking to a couple of the elders this morning. I said, if you wanted to know my heart message, like, like, like the message that really like I like live with I, the one that I think about constantly. It is the fact that we should be interceding. And maybe because my past is so jacked up and I know some of y'all's past is kind of jacked up and you guys were living in darkness and you were wicked and you were evil. Yet someone somewhere on this rock prayed for you, interceded for you when everyone else thought there was no hope. When everyone else looked like you were a lost cause, somebody, maybe a mama, maybe a grandmama, maybe your daddy, maybe a preacher that you met one time, maybe a friend at work, somebody prayed for you. Somebody stood in the gap and you are here. You received Messiah. You repented of sin. And now the, the, the veil has been dropped from your eyes so you can see truth. That didn't happen by accident. You know, the prophet Ezekiel, he reminds us that Yahweh is always seeking intercession. Looking at Ezekiel chapter 22, I mean, this is powerful. The people of the land have oppressively blessed. Now, you go back and you read this. There are so many evil things happening in Ezekiel's day. And he has lift a couple of them. The people of the land have oppressively blackmailed, plundered in robbery, wronged the poor and the needy, abused the outsider unjustly. Does that look like today? I mean, it's almost like Ezekiel had a picture of what America, or dare I say the world, would look like in 2024. 
wickedness, evil, haters of God, backbiters of Yahweh. But what does he say? So this is this is like this is important. Like all of this stuff is happening. What does he say? I search for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand in the breach. Yahweh's doing the same thing today. He's looking for someone who'll stand in the breach before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. That hurts a little bit. It's got a sting to it, doesn't it? Like maybe right now in the room, there's a little bit of conviction. Like when was the last time I truly prayed for the government? Instead of sat there and gave my governmental opinion. I'm just being real. Like we're more, we're more concerned, like, like in the body of Messiah. Now I know this isn't everybody, but right, if it fits, put it on. Like we're more concerned about whether what party's gonna win instead of praying Yahweh's will to be done. Instead of praying for revival and repentance, we want a particular person in the office. But what if that's not Yahweh's will? What if Yahweh's will is completely different than ours, heaven forbid? What would happen? Instead of, you know, I said this last week because it just irritates me because I've heard the, I've heard all the conversations. I've heard everybody talk about it. Like you, you, you look at YouTube, you look at all these stuff, and you look at the Olympics, and everybody's like, ah, oh, look at all you. Yeah, but does that drive us to our knees? Are we real? Are we grieved for what God grieves? That's what intercession is. Intercession happens that a burden lays down upon us as followers of Christ. And it should weight us down to drive us into prayer. Powerful. I didn't even got to the, the, the message yet. This is just like, let's lay a foundation. Where are the intercessors? Where were the intercessors? Where was the one person who would stand between Yahweh's wrath and the people? I.e., like this is like the, the shadowing of salvation. This is exactly what our Messiah did. This is why he is our example in intercession. When wrath was getting ready to come upon Mike, Yahweh steps in and says, I'm enough. My death was enough. My blood is enough. See, we can continue throughout Scripture. We see examples of this throughout the Bible. When we see names like the faithful ones who did indeed stand in the gap. Now, today, you know, lack of time, there's no way we can talk about all of them. But looking at guys like Abraham, obviously, right? Let's not forget Moses or Nehemiah or even Esther. Like, look at throughout the scriptures where men and women, knowing Yahweh, knowing who God is, stood in the gap for people. Abraham intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, we were talking about this with uh, one of the brothers <laughs> yesterday. And I'm like, think about the negotiation that was going on on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. The pleading of like, if I could find a hundred, right? If I could find 50, what about 25, Yahweh? If you can just find five, I'll spare them. Is that not, does that not just like stir us? Moses interceded for the nation of Israel. How many times? How many times do we look through the Torah and we see that God's like, I'm done. I'm wiping them out. Moses, we're going to make you into a great nation. Everybody else, I'm dusting. We're done. But yet, Moses, being Moses, pleads with the Lord on behalf of Yahweh's people, even using a little bit of Jewish guilt on God. Right? Why should the Egyptians speak? And say he brought them out to harm them. Isn't that what Moses pleaded with Yahweh about? To kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Powerful. Look here in Psalms, it testifies to that. Well, this is the result. I didn't have this in. I must have missed this passage. But this is the result because there was no one standing in the gap with Ezekiel. So therefore I've poured out my fury on them. I've consumed them. Look at context. Context says, I'm looking for someone. All this evil exists. Now I'm looking for someone to stand in the gap. I can't find none. Therefore, is the next verse. 
I'll pour out my fury on them. I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I've brought their own way upon their heads. It is a declaration of Edonai. That's powerful. Yahweh's looking, even today I believe this, I believe that Yahweh is looking for someone to stand in the gap. To take the burden on their shoulder. To call out to him and plead for the nations. Plead for our loved ones. Sons and daughters, brothers, sisters, cousins. I say this a lot up here. I know, and I know, and it's not just because I just want the burden to stick, right? Because, man, if we really believe that we're, 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 the, the pot is being stirred and, and the, the labor pains are beginning. Yes, we can rejoice because one day we'll look up and Messiah is going to be coming. But I, I feel like there should be a burden in that moment, right? Like if I really believe that Jesus is coming back, that means I may have a son that doesn't know him. I have a father or a mother or a cousin or a friend at work or someone that I call my BFF, whatever. My neighbors that I love that I do cookouts with. Maybe even the person that I sit next to in church who doesn't have that relationship with Messiah. Who will intercede? Jumping back over to what Moses did in Psalms 106, 23. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them. He would destroy them. What? had not Moses, his chosen one, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. How powerful is that? Moses standing in the gap. We know that Moses is the foreshadow of Yeshua. But it brings me back, like if that's, if that's Messiah, if Messiah says that no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend, then if that's the imitation, if that's what we're supposed to be doing, are we standing in the gap for our friends? Do we see them every day and just like, hey, how you doing? Oh, how was your weekend? Oh, I went to church. It was so good. Oh, whoa. Got to worship. Shabbat, Oneg. How was your weekend? We mentioned last week a quote from Charles Spurgeon that he would rather teach one man to pray than 10 men to preach. And I find myself thinking about this, right? When we think about Messiah, when we look at the example that he set before us, um, we don't find that in the New Testament. We don't find Messiah. We don't find that. We don't find Messiah teaching the disciples how to preach. Now, I'm not like the experts like in the in the word. I feel like I've got some pretty good time in there. But I haven't found that passage where Yeshua sits down with his disciples and go, let me show you how to put together a really good humdinger of a message. Like, I'm going to bring, you're gonna, man, this is going to draw people to your church. Even Moses himself, right? Stuttering problem, right? But he connected with Yahweh. Messiah never did that, but what did he do? He showed them how to connect with God. That was important. Not only that, but if we look at the example that Messiah left with the disciples, he would go minister and then what? Go away and pray. He'd heal. He'd deliver. What did he do next? Go away and pray. He'd preach. He'd teach. He'd instruct. He'd go away and pray. Prayer was huge. He's our imitator. So we're going to say we believe in what John says in the passage of 1 John, then we gotta, we've got to bring this to reality and go, wait a minute. He's my intercessor. intercessor. He's my example. How am I interceding in an interceding for others? But when the, when the disciples, this is interesting, when the disciples came to know the realization, this is powerful, because you've got to put your Jewish mindset on for a second. Because the Jews... And the Jew, in, in that day and time, they didn't just pray one time a day or maybe five minutes a day. That's not what they did. The custom was three times, a, three times a day, morning, noon, and night. And there's Hebrew words, there's Jewish words for all of that. But that's not the point. The point is, these guys prayed three times a day. They grew up, they were Jewish, all right? It's not like, like oh, like this is a new thought. And they realized that they're not very good at prayer. How do we know that? Because... When they go to Jesus and they ask him, or he, they ask him, teach us to pray. 
So there was something in Messiah that the disciples realized, wait, we're praying like this three times a day, but we're not praying like him. We're not doing it like he does. So he compels them, or they compel him, teach us. Charles Spurgeon says it this way. He says, men of God, if you are indeed the Lord's and feel that you are his, begin now, this is powerful, to intercede for all who belong to you. Never be satisfied unless they're saved too. Wow. Like the disciples see something in Jesus. And I think like Spurgeon's kind of on to something. They're like, wait a second. We're not moving things the way he moves things. Matthew 6, 6, right? But you, this is what he's going to He's going to tell them how to pray. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the do's and the don'ts of this passage, but there is some things in here that I think would be, we'd be, uh, I'd be doing a disservice if we didn't point them out. He said, but you notice something when you pray, go into your inner room, some say closet, some say chamber, some there's different. And when you, I'm emphasizing this for a reason, have shut your door, pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will what? Reward you or repay you. So this is something that's super important. I want you to get. So the first thing I want us to see with unequivocal evidence within that passage is how Yeshua describes prayer. That number one, this is a private matter. This is very, very important. He says, go away. Go into your chamber alone. And here's what's important. I believe that what Yeshua is telling us is to get away from all the distractions as well. Right? Some of y'all who pray, you understand what I'm talking about. What I'm about to say, like, like it's like early morning hours. Nobody's awake, right? You got your cup of coffee, got your Bible laid out nice and still and quiet in the house, especially if you have children, and you go start praying. What happens? Oh, they are up, right? They are up. The dog starts barking, right? The livestock's going crazy. Something distracts you. But she was telling them, he's like, go in your room. Remove the distraction. Make this thing private. And Yahweh, who sees what you're doing in private, will reward you. This is powerful. It's vital because of what we're going to see in our next text. To understand. So moving on. This is critical. I want you to get this. Matthew 6, 9. Therefore, Pray in this way. Now, before we go into this, I know a lot of people just believe, like, let's just quote the, he was giving us a, a basically a way of praying. This actually goes with Judaism, and you'll see it here in a second. But a lot of people pray this prayer, and I think that's fine if you pray this prayer, but he's giving us kind of a, a skeleton, an example that we can go to and look at on how we should pray. But I want you to notice something even more important than that. I, I think it's so powerful. Therefore, pray in this way, our Father... You see that? Our Father in heaven, sanctified be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us. You haven't seen it yet, have you? Let me go back here. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room. And when you have shut your door. Y'all see? Isn't it interesting that when he starts to pray, like he's telling them individually, go into your individual rooms. But then when we pray, a lot of people say, well, he's preaching. He's tell, he, because he's talking to the apostles, that's why he's using this pluralism. That's not true. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But I want you to see this. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but what? Deliver us from the evil one. This is absolutely, this will change the way you pray. I mean, this is going to be like, we use this and we'll come in and we, we like almost like overuse this, 
the Lord's Prayer. And it's really not called the Lord's Prayer. It's called the Disciples' Prayer. But what's interesting to me is he's doing this. I'm, sh- I'm, I'm, I'm here to believe this. This is so powerful. And we've always thought that it's kind of an individual prayer. I don't believe that. Because when we look at commentary and we look at customs within the Judaism, you'll find something different. This is traditional Judaism right in your face right here. What do you mean, Mike? Let me show you what a commentary of the Jewish New Testament says about this very prayer. It is so good. We have an extra slide. There we go. Just tell me to keep going, right? Now, I know this makes small. Can you all see that good? It says, Our Father in heaven, Avu Shemayim, open my uh, opens many Hebrew prayers. So the very fact that way he says the very beginning is a typical opening for Hebrew prayer. The next two lines recall the first portion of the synagogue prayer known as the Kadash or Kadish, which says magnify and sanctify, holy be your name, right? Um, be his great name throughout the world, which he has created according to his will, right? It's exactly what Messiah is doing. And may he establish his kingdom in your lifetime. Now watch this. This is so good. The plural phrasing, give us, forgive us, lead us, is characteristically Jewish. Big surprise, right? Big surprise that our Jewish Messiah would teach the disciples how to pray like Judaism, right? But here, watch this. This is so good. Focusing on what? The group rather than isolated individuals. How do we pray today, though? We pray about my needs. We pray about individual needs. We're good at sometimes doing that. But Messiah is teaching them to pray, and he's telling them, this is what your focus should be. Not just you. It's us. It's our. Notice even Yeshua using his name in the the pluralism is absolutely, it's inclusive to him. That's what blows me away about that. Like he's telling the disciples, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He's teaching us a powerful principle. He reminds us that when we go into prayer, that it's not about us or about you. That it should not be, that it should be about others. That's the power of intercession. How do we know that? Because in Isaiah 52 that we read, right, he was the intercessor. He sets the example for us in every way, not just in following the Torah and obedience to the commandments, but even the way he prays should be our example. Now, to prove this, let's jump over to the Tanakh. Let's look at a, a, one of the stories of these great guys that are in the Bible that we read about. And let's look at something very startling that I believe because it's just it's just what carries over into the New Testament. And nothing brings this to light or uh, light or greater emphasis than in the prophet of Daniel. Daniel, man, this is so good. So Daniel hears that Yahweh's judgment's coming. Much like we know, right? We have heard, like we know Yahweh's judgment is coming. And the more we look at this world, we see it, don't we? But what does Daniel do? Daniel does what we should be doing. Daniel says in Daniel 9, verse 3, So I set my face to the Lord God to what? Seek him by prayer and supplication. With fasting, we're going to be talking about that in a couple of weeks or next week here, and sackcloth and ashes. This is serious stuff. This is serious. Who's praying now? Let's get that established. Who's, who's praying? Come on, Daniel. So I set my face to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Jumping over to verse 4. I prayed to Adonai my God and confessed. Saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him and keep his, co- his, uh, his mitzvot, his commandments. We have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We have turned away from your commandments. And from your rulings. The very thing that we're seeing Messiah teach us in the New Testament is exactly what we see with Daniel. Daniel standing in the gap. 
Daniel the prophet, don't forget this. He reads the scroll. He sees that something's coming because of sin, wickedness, and the evil around his people. And does he pray just for himself? No. He begins to intercede for all of Israel. You're going to see that here in just a moment. Jumping into verse 6. Wow. I want you to feel the weight of this. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Wait a minute. Wait a minute here. Is it Daniel the prophet? Who spoke in your name to our kings, our leaders, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. This, this, this is heavy. He's standing in the gap. And not only does he just pray for the people, he goes all the way back, doesn't he? He goes all the way back to the kings. Do we have a king? No, we don't have a king, but we have a president. Do we have a White House? We have government. We have Congress. We have all that stuff. We do. Notice what he does. Notice what's not missing. Or Pardon me. Notice what is not there. Get him, God. Judge him. Make him burn. Come get me, Lord. Save me. Forget about these wicked people. I'm ready. I am yours. Look how righteous I am, Yahweh. And I'm trying to tell them, you know, I've been preaching to them day in and day out, talking to the king, talking to the prophets. Lord, you have seen the work and the toil of my hands. It's not what he's doing. You, Lord, are righteousness. But shame covers our face. To this day, the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, near and far, in all the countries where you have banished them because they have behaved unfaithfully towards you. Watch. Adonai, shame covers our face. Who removes our shame? Who removes our past? The condemnation, the guilt. Of our sin, Yahweh, or Yeshua, right? He's the only one. And what is Daniel doing? He's doing exactly what we should be doing. He takes on the very thing that Jesus did, right? He took upon the same shame when he died upon the cross. Our kings, our leaders, our fathers, because what? We have sinned against you. See, Jesus is teaching his disciples what real prayer looks like. Daniel is demonstrating it. He's showing it what it looks like. See, if you're looking for a recipe to follow for intercessory prayer, I'm telling you right now, brothers and sisters, man, Daniel has it. Notice who he's praying for, our kings, our leaders, our fathers. He's not casting blame. What is he doing? He's pleading for Yahweh's mercy. Jumping into verse 10. We've not obeyed the voice of Adonai Elohenu by walking in this Torah that he set before us. His servants, the prophets, or through the servants, the prophets, which is interesting again, Daniel's a prophet. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your Torah and has turned away. Can I rephrase that just like this is Mike version. Can I give you a Mike version of this for real quick? How about this? Yes, all America has transgressed your Torah. Would that be false? No, it wouldn't. Or the world? Or my family? My community? Therefore, the curse and sworn judgment written in the Torah of Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, has been poured upon us. For we have sinned against him. This isn't the way we pray today. We pray prayers like, your will be done, Yahweh. Your will be done. Oh, guard me, protect me. No greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. 
Does that scripture take on new meaning to you today? I hope it does. Some of you may not be called to catch a bullet for someone else, but greater love than this, that you would lay down your life, laying down your will and going into a place of prayer and intercession for your brother and for your sister, for the people that are around you in your neighborhood, your communities. This hits me hard. Daniel, knowing what the people of Israel have done, knowing that they have sinned against Yahweh, violated his Torah, goes into a place of prayer and he begins to intercede for his people. Notice the language that he is using. Notice that he throws himself into the mix. See, the words are face. We have sinned against you. These words are personal. This is the heart of an intercessor. Watch. It's, he's not done. Like, like he, you know, he could, in rightful place where who, pro, who the prophet is right here, Daniel, he could rightfully stand up and declare Yahweh's judgment. Do you understand that? He could rightfully, because the people were wicked. The people were wicked, but that's not what we see in the heart of Daniel. What do we say? Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, let your anger and your fury turn away. Please. The prophet said, please. Whoa. From Jerusalem, your city, your holy mountain, because of our sin and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of scorn for all those around us. And he is bearing testimony. You know, I could preach this. You know why? Where's the church? The church has become a scorn to this world. I was talking with a brother that if I mentioned him, you'd know who he is. And we were talking about this as how, how wickedness was allowed to thrive in this world because men and women of Yahweh who know him, who have this personal relationship with him. And as we discussed last week, which is powerful, right? Jesus gives us access to go before the holy throne room of God. And we don't take advantage of it. Instead, we become, pardon me, we become a little lazy in our spiritual walk. We become a little lazy in praying. We become a little lazy. In, well, you know, somebody else will do that. I don't have time for that today. But I can tell you everything going wrong in the world. I can give you statistics. I can give you stats. I can tell you everything that happened on CNN and Fox and what the president did or didn't do or what the, the guys are up and running, what they're doing and what they believe. I can tell you all that information. My question is, what does Yahweh say about it? What is God saying about it? I want us to understand something, that he is praying for the entire nation at this point. Notice also that he's not saying, Lord, they deserve it. He's saying, turn away from your wrath. It's exactly what Moses did, isn't it? Isn't that the same thing Moses? Moses stands in the way, don't kill him. Don't kill him. What will people say about you? He's doing exactly what Messiah did. He's standing in the gap, standing between Yahweh's fury and the rebellion of people. Let me ask you something. When you see the wickedness of our world, when you hear and you see hearts turning away from God, what are your first instincts? I pray that our heart would turn towards Yahweh. I pray that we would plead for his compassion on those who are rebellious. Can I just be honest for a minute, a little transparent? I have people in my family that aren't saved. I have a son right now that's rebellious towards Yahweh, or they have the things of God. And it grieves me. And if just this, if I could somehow get in the way between Yahweh, and I know I'm not the Savior, if I could just get in the way and plead, Yahweh, please hold back. Please hold back your wrath. Please hold back your fury that's coming to this world. Lord, may you open his eyes. May he see the love and the mercy that you have for him. Question, who are you praying for? Who is it in your life? Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a family member. I don't know. Maybe it's your neighbor that lives right next door to you. Maybe it's a Muslim across the street or the Mormon down the road. Hallelujah. I was going to say something, but I think I stepped on enough too there. 
This brings to my heart when Yeshua was in the temple with his disciples. It's one of my, one, I have a lot of favorite scriptures, so this is one of them again. But it just shows Yahweh or Yeshua's heart, his compassion, right? You, you, you know the story, right? Luke 18, 10, like two men went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, knew the Torah, good at the Torah, and the other, a tax collector. Now, there are things in this world now that tax collectors, we kind of like, eh, we growl it, we don't like them, right? We don't like paying taxes. But there are other things that have happened now in our world that we rate the same thing that has that same standing as the tax collector back in that day. They were the worst of the worst. They had bad reputations. The main, the main reason they had bad reputations is because a lot of times it was their Jewish brothers and sisters, or brothers that were in those positions that were coming and taxing the people. Now, in our day and time, there's other scarlet letters. There are other things that are out there. So you can put whatever you want in that in that ta- in that little bracket right there for yourself. What is that mo- one person, that one type of person that you despise above everything? Put that in there. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. Oh, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people. Thieving, unjust, and adulterers, or even a tax collector. I fast twice a week and I tithe all that I get. But the tax collector standing some distance away wouldn't even lift his eyes towards heaven but beat his chest saying God be merciful to me the sinner. I tell you this man rather than the other he is begging God for mercy. He is pleading with Yahweh. And Yeshua says, I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went down to his home, declared righteous. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Can we hang on for that for just a moment? Brothers and sisters, I want you to get this for a moment. Listen to what he just said. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Like, I get it. We have come to Torah. We've come to a truth that is absolutely just wonderful in our faith. It makes our faith make sense. But please don't be that guy. For everyone who exalts himself, look at me, I found Torah. Look at how smart I am. Look at how I know the Bible. I know the scripture. I'm not like these people that are out there at the Olympics. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. One of the greatest ways we stay in position of humility is that of standing and praying for others. Do you need humility in your life? Can I just be honest? The greatest way you can humble yourself is pray for someone else. Remembering that we too needed someone to pray for us. We too were lost and in sin. We too rejected Yahweh's commandments. But by His grace and the prayers of someone, we're here. Now, I want you to see what Daniel does here. It's so beautiful of an intercessor. So now, our God, listen to the prayers and the petitions of your servant and cause your faith to shine upon your devastated sanctuary. For the sake of my Lord, watch, give ear, my God, and hear, open your eyes and see our dissolution, our desolation, and the city called by your name. We do not present our supplications before you because of our own righteousness. But what? Because of, we'll go back there. But because of your, but because of your great compassion. Isn't that beautiful? That's a humbling statement, right? Like we don't pray for the world because we're something. We pray because he is something. He is compassionate. He is filled with mercy. He is filled with grace. It's powerful. But to say, Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act for your own sake. He pulled the Moses. Oh, my God, do not delay for your city and your people are called by your name. Again, 
we see over and over again and that we need to pay attention to how Daniel is praying. He's bringing in the supplications. And this is how we should be praying. This is how we can, can and should be coming before to Messiah, knowing that we have nothing, but that he is filled with mercy and compassion. Here's where it gets even better. Here's what I love about this prayer, because Daniel interceded for the people and for the nation of Israel. Watch what happens. While I was still speaking and praying, verse 20, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before Adonai my God on behalf of the holy mountain of my God. Verse 21, yes, while I was praying, Gabriel, Gabriel, sorry, the one I had seen in the earlier vision came to me swiftly about the time of the evening offering. This is powerful. So the moment he began to pray, the moment he set his heart to intercede for the nation, right? What happens? Gabriel is sent out. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I've come now to give you insight and understanding. Watch at the beginning of your request. A message went out. Whew. This will preach you happy a little bit, man. A message went out, and I have come to declare it to you, for you are greatly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Because he stood in the gap. When he stood in the gap, swiftly, Gabriel was sent out. And he wasn't just sent out, he was sent out with a message. In other words, we go all the way back to week one, our prayers matter. And they matter greatly when we're in intercession. And I want us to remember what we are, what we were, what were one of the keys last week. We spoke about the key of persevering. We, we, we spoke of the key of, you don't just kind of throw these Hail Mary prayers out, but stand in the gap. Stay consistent in your prayer life. Don't give up. Keep Remember we said, keep on asking, keep on knocking, keep on seeking. I know that's an out of order. Send me an email. But it brings us back to James, right? It, like, like we read Daniel, and then I can't help but to go to James, right? So confess your offenses to one another. Pray for one another so you may be healed. What? The effective prayer of a righteous person is very powerful. Now, now I think the TLV really does not do justice on that word, the effective prayer. It literally means, and if you look at it and study it out, the continual prayer of a righteous person. The continual prayer of a righteous person. The continual prayer of a righteous person. Don't quit. Keep praying. Keep seeking, right? But here's what, where it gets really good. So we quote this passage and we don't go to the next one. That's how, kind of how we got into a Sunday Christianity. I, just, I didn't say that out loud. I'm sorry. But right, can we, we cherry pick scriptures. He says, pray for one another. You're always not a respecter of person. Did you know that? Well, that's, you know, that's Daniel. I mean, Daniel, I mean, think about it. Daniel. Not a respecter of person, man. He's not. We see this in the next verse. I love this. Elijah. Like Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it might, might not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, hold that for just a minute. Don't take that off there for a second. This is really good. You know why? Because notice, Elijah wasn't praying for himself. Like, he wasn't like waking up, like, you know, I'd really like to have a little rain. I put some crops in the ground the other day, and I got to get some rain. Let me go out there. Hey, Yahweh, you know, help me out. He's praying for the nation, he's praying for the world. It's a drought. It's a drought. And it says that Elijah was a man like you, like me, the same nature. And he prayed earnestly. He prayed continually. I want you to see this. You and I can go into the throne room on behalf of someone else for your city, for your nation, for your family, your children. And look at what Paul does. Paul just brings it in. I mean, just hits us right between the eyes, right? But what does it matter? Look at this. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether in dishonesty or in truth, Messiah is being proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. What does he rejoice? <laughs> yes. This is so good. 
I will keep rejoicing. Why? Why will he keep rejoicing? For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. What's going to turn out for his deliverance, Paul? Through your intercession. Paul knew it. Paul knew the power of the body of Messiah praying for him. Why? Because that's what it says. Did I miss that? I did. Go back. Did you already hit it? You did. Through your intercession and the help of the Ruach of the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, Paul knew it. Paul knew the power of it. But you know one of the greatest stories? Like, we just came out of Peter, right? And Peter has one of the greatest testimonies of the power of intercession. Do you know that? It's one of the greatest stories in the Bible that sometimes we can overlook. And it's one of my favorite scriptures. That's true, though. This is really true. It's one of my favorite stories that's in the Bible. We know that Peter was incarcerated. He was locked up, right? And while he was locked up, chains fell off, doors opened, escorted out, right? But watch this. This is so good. And this is going to wrap us up. This will be the final scripture right here. So Peter was kept in prison. Watch. But prayer for him was being offered fervently to God. By Messiah's community. So if you know the story, if you don't know the story, let me give you the ending. It's really cool. It's kind of funny, actually. Right? I mean, it's absolutely hilarious. So he gets out of prison. They're praying. They're still in prayer. Now, we don't know what the distance was from the jailhouse to the house that everybody was gathered, the community was at. But what we do know is that Peter goes to the house where they're in prayer. Knock on the door. A little boy opens it up, thinks it's a ghost, shuts the door. And they go on, continue praying. They're like, wait a minute, Peter's outside. How did Peter get out? Because the community prayed. I want to challenge you today. This is why we hung out in Daniel. This is why we wanted to start out by giving us an understanding of what it means to truly follow Yeshua and understanding who he is. And if we're going to imitate him, let's not neglect being intercessors. Let's not neglect standing in the gap for someone else. I could use your prayers. I know you can use mine. I know you can. And we pray for you. So I want to challenge each of you this week. Here is a challenge that you can take home with you. Take this week and begin to pray and intercede for the things that you see wrong. Can you believe I'm going to ask you to pray for that kind of stuff? Like everything you see wrong, get you a journal and start writing it out. And begin to pray and seek Yahweh. And ask His will to be done. He may even use you to bring it about. Maybe you need to pray for your city. Maybe your family. Your country. We have a lot of things going on right now in our country. And there's a lot of big decisions coming up. Let's intercede. Let's go to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's see. Let's taste and see that the Lord is good and that he is true to his commandments, but he's also true to his promises. And let's not forget that. We're going to go to a time of prayer. Can't think of a better time to do that. And I want to, I'm going to start us off and then we're just going to have some music playing in the background. And that if you need prayer, if I could have you guys, you guys stay seated. Stay seated right there in the, in the corner. Um, Scott and Donna are right back there in the back. You can wave at us, right? And then if I could have uh, Brother Jordan and Miss Brooke, if you guys would go to this corner over here. If you need personal prayer today, got our elders here. Um, please go to them and let them pray with you. You know, the Bible says, man, that, that when two agree as touching anything, it is established by our Heavenly Father. How powerful is that? What a great promise. You may need that today, maybe for your family or whatever's going on in your life. Go to them, let them pray over you. And for the rest of us that are going to be in our chairs, let's begin to, let's ask that. I always ask this every week. Let's ask the Holy Spirit. Let's ask him and seek him. Like, what does this mean for me? Maybe it means you got to get up a little earlier in the morning. Maybe instead of complaining and griping about the world we live in, maybe we revert that and start praying for the world we live in. Maybe we start being a light in this dark world, instead of the other stuff. Let's seek Yahweh. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we worship you. And we know there is nothing small that you can't do, and we know that there's nothing large that you can't do. 
May our hearts be Yahweh to have ears to hear and eyes to see. That as the world continues to go into a backwards motion. Father, I pray that we would have a burden to pray. A burden, Lord God, to know that what Yeshua has done in our life, that you would do the same in them. That, Lord, those who are trapped in the lie of homosexuality and transgenderism, Lord, that you can deliver them. Those who have given abortion or in the process of it, you can set them free, Father. For those who are walking out, whatever lie this world and our enemy has given to them, we know you can break that lie. And Lord, we lift them up to you today. May we have a heart and a burden for the people, Lord God, who are are going astray, for those who are lost and wandering in the dark. May we be a light to them. May our hearts grieve for them. May everything that we look upon when we're going into work or driving home or we're even in our in, during our own egg, Father, and whatever it is that we're doing, study scripture, may you remind us how important it is that we pray for the people around us. Lord, I thank you that you delivered us. I thank you that you put someone in our life or someone was praying for us. And because of that, our eyes were open, our hearts were softened. May you do the same, Lord, for those that we have connection with, whether it's at work or our family, those who despise you even. May you soften their hearts. May you lead them by your Ruach HaKadosh, your Holy Spirit, to come and know the Savior, the one that is the true intercessor who stood in the gap when we couldn't, who took our shame when we had a load of it. Father, we pray for them that they would come into a right relationship with you, that your Holy Spirit would draw them. Lord, as we pray, Father, have your way. Have your way online and in person, Father. Would you just have your way? Have your way, Father. In Yeshua's name.
Father, as Daniel prayed for Israel and Yeshua prayed for Jerusalem, Lord, I pray corporately with my brothers and sisters here, Lord, we, we just want to stand in the gap for the great nation of Israel. Lord, we know that a thousand can fall at their side and 10,000 at their right hand, but Lord, nothing shall come near them. We ask first and foremost, Lord, that they would have the revelation of Messiah. That they would come to know Jesus as Lord and King of their life. We pray, Father, for their protection from the northern border to the southern border, from their eastern border and their western border. Lord, that you would surround, surround them, Father. We ask Messiah for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, I pray that you'd expose the works of the enemy, their enemies, as they've tried to come against them. We pray, Father, that once again, as you have always done, that you would deliver them. Lord, that people from everywhere will know who did it. And how it was done. Lord, I pray for revival in Jerusalem. I pray for revival in Israel. Pour your spirit out, Father, that they would come to know you. In the name of Yeshua. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for the challenge. We give you all the glory and all the power. In Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Can we go get the the little ones? Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I'm so grateful for all of you being here today. This is just, I think this is like the fun stuff's fixing to happen. We've got Oneg. And so if you came today and you're a guest, or maybe you're you didn't make any plans to stay and hang out with us, we want to encourage you to stay. Visit with people. We have Oneg, which means to delight. We're going to delight in the Lord. If you are new here, what we're going to do is we're going to pick up the, not yet, be patient. We're going to pray here in a minute, but we're going to pick up all the chairs. And so once we dismiss here in just a moment, we're going to ask you to grab your stuff. We got young people that are going to bring out some tables and we're going to put the chairs back. And uh, any way that you can help with that, just follow the crowd. You'll see what's going on here in just a moment. But for that, we want to bless our wonderful children that are here. If they are all coming in. And if, even if you didn't have your children in our class, you are more than welcome to surround them and bring your child up here and get underneath the hoopah so that we can bless them. We have a plethora of children. Some people's quivers are full and some quivers are getting fuller. We have a lot of that happening. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on in here. Bring them kids on up here. Come on. Come on. Get up underneath the hoopah. Come on. Come on up here, brother. Come on, squeeze on through. If you don't have a child right now, come on in here. Praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. If you would, let me bless them, and then we'll do a prayer together. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of children. Lord, your word declares that children are a blessing from you. And so, Lord, we thank you for them. We ask you that you would bless them coming in and that you would bless them going out. We ask that you would be that they they would be the head and not the tail. We thank you, Lord God, that they rise above the children of the world in knowledge and in stature and in the fear of Yahweh. We thank you that you're guarding them, you're protecting them, Father, so that they can experience the life that you have for them, that as they grow into young men and young women, Father, they will find their calling, they will find their purpose found and wrapped up in you and the relationship with Yeshua. So, Father, together we declare this blessing over them. My sons, may the Lord make you as Ephraim and Manasseh, as Yachanan the Immerser, as Rahav Shaul. My daughters, may the Lord make you as Sarah, as Rebecca, as Naomi and Ruth. May your desire be for Yeshua to glorify his name. And may the Lord enable your hearts to hear, to learn, to do, and to fulfill all the words of his Torah. May the Lord grant you a portion in the Lamb's book of life through faith in Messiah Yeshua. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and grant you his peace. Amen and amen. All right, don't leave. Don't leave. Hang on a minute. Go back to your chair. Praise Yahweh. And then we're going to do the Arionic blessing. And then we're going to bless the food and Oneg. And then we'll wrap this up.
Hallelujah. You guys look so good today. Look at the, I was just telling someone, I was wearing that exact shirt yesterday. Praise God. I love that shirt. It's a great shirt. Hallelujah. All right. Let me bless you, please. Grab your kids. Quiet down for just a moment. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom. Father, we thank you for an amazing time together. For Oneg, as we fellowship, Lord, may our conversations be edifying and encouraging. Lord, may your revelation of your Torah just come alive as we have those wonderful conversations. May you bless the food that's been presented and prepared by those in this community. And Father, we declare, Baruch Atah Elonai Elohim Elachalam, Hamat Lachim Min Haret, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Hey Hey. Shabbat shalom, hey. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, hey. Shabbat shalom, 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 shabb